lot of study. I put a lot of work into this tonight, and I did want to uh, teach, you, teach you as much as I can. Uh, and I want to say thank you for being here. You know, last week what we started was doctrine. Uh, it was a study for each of the Thursday evenings moving forward. We're going to go through, you know, your basic doctrines. We're going to go through the ABCs of Christianity. We're going to roll back. We're going to do the ABCs of Christianity again, but a little bit deeper. It's going to be like your two. It's going to be like your sophomore class of college. We're going to go a little bit deeper of those ABCs that second time. Uh, but last week, does anybody remember what we covered? The, the most important doctrine of all. Salvation. salvation. That's what we talked about. And salvation and what that means for us. Last, last week there was four points, and I'll just go over them quickly. You know, we had to remember what we were. Salvation. We had to remember that we were lost sinners. We were dead to sin. Uh, we were just lost. And then the, the, the second point was, well, we're lost, okay, but God promised us something. God promised us eternal life. He promised to forgive us of all of our sins, and he promised to dwell inside of us. His, his comforter, his Holy Ghost, and he comes and lives inside of us when we get saved. Mm -hmm. Now, what did we do? We, we saw our condition. Then we saw that uh, God had made a promise. Well, this, the third thing was, well, we had to do something. You know, we were, uh, we called upon the name of the Lord. We believed in him to save us, and then we received eternal life. And then the last thing, what God did, and what he did is he justified. He washed us in his blood. He wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. He adopted us into his own family. He sanctified us. You know, he set us apart. We're a peculiar people. We're different. And then he made us into a new creature. The old man has passed away and all things are new. Now that we are saved, that was last week, well, then what's next? What's the next thing for a Christian to do? Well, that's where we're going to get to. I need some help, men. Do you think you can help me? Brody, if you could... Get this out. Go ahead. Everybody needs one of these, or whatever you have left over, you can go ahead and bring back. Get those out. One to everybody, and we're going to be going through something new, something different this Thursday evening. Well, you're saved. Amen. Well, what's Amen. next? What's the next thing? Well, if you have your Bibles, take them to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Somebody challenged me. They said, "We would. Could you make us? Could you, could you take the church, Pastor, and could you make us like the disciples of Jesus?" Well, I sure wish, but I am not Jesus Christ. Uh, I am nothing close to Jesus Christ. I sure wish and hope and strive to be, but I will do my best to teach you the Bible. But I, I don't know about the, the very apostles of Christ. That's a tough one. That is a great standard. It's something that we should all strive to be like. Now, what are we looking at right here? What does God expect of us? You know, well, we've got salvation nailed down. Okay, good. Now, what does God expect of me? What, what, what's the next thing for us? Well, you've got your Bibles, and you're in John chapter 3. Uh, you know, there's different traditions. There's different customs. You know, for a Thursday evening, it's a little bit more relaxed. I won't ask you to stand and read, but if you could follow along, John chapter 3. We're going to be doing a lot of it. We don't have to. No, 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 I'm saying it's a tradition, right? It's not commanded. You're not going to find that in the Word of God. It is a tradition. But on a Thursday evening, you know, we're going we're gonna to be a little bit uh, more. John chapter 3, in the first eight verses, I'll start reading. And we're going to find out exactly what does God expect of us. Okay, let's start at the basics. John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of spirit. John chapter 3. 
three. You've got it right there. We just read it. So what do you suppose are the fill-ins right there? According to the Bible, another term for becoming a Christian is to be born again. Born again. Born again. Born again. And I know this is milk. I know this is milk, but we got to start somewhere, okay? All right. The, if you think about the Bible, the greatest book in, in history, the greatest book ever written, we have it. Men shed their blood. They died. They burned. They suffered so that way we could have this very book that we hold in our hands now, and we can go down to the Dollar Tree and buy one for a dollar. Well, men had to suffer for this book. It was a big deal, and it's not so much of a big deal nowadays, people seem to think, but it is. Now, the Bible, an amazing book. If the Bible had a heart, you know, where, where would it be? Well, let's just say that the Old Testament and the New Testament, if the Bible had a heart, I'd say it would be in the New Testament. You know, if the, if the New Testament had a heart, well, I think it would be the Gospels. Now, let's say that the Gospels, okay, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If the, if the four Gospels had a heart, I would say it would be the book of John. If John, the very book of John, had a heart, I'd say it would be chapter 3. Amen. Right here, located in the very heart of the heart of the heart of the Scriptures, is a man, a Pharisee, who comes to Jesus by night. This man came by night, not by day, probably because he feared of what people would say or what they would think. This man, when you would look at him, his phylacteries, his, his garment was no doubt uh, large. You know, that would be a, a symbol of power, a, a symbol of status. Uh, we think of today, he would be a man who probably had a PhD from uh, Yale. Uh, a man who, if you were to look at this man, you were to just see him, you could regard him as spiritual. You would regard him as religious. You would regard him as holy. You would look at this man, and you'd say, wow, no doubt that man right there is saved, is what you might think when you look at him. And here, in chapter 3, in the heart of the heart of the heart, Jesus teaches that man that he must be born again to be saved, and this man doesn't even understand that. Now, if you want to be saved, that's me and you. If you want to be Christian, then you must be born again. Now we'll move on. John chapter 3, and in verse 6, look back at it. It, it teaches that there are how many births? Two. Dope. Two. Dopes. There are two births. There's a physical birth. That's what all of us have been birthed into this world as. But then there's that second. That's the spiritual birth. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, go ahead and turn there with me. And like I said, we're going to be doing some flipping tonight, okay, guys? First Peter chapter two, verse two, ten or twelve more books past where we were just at in the New Testament. First Peter coming towards the end of the New Testament. First Peter chapter two, verse two. I'll go ahead and read. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Mm. As a new Christian. What does this scripture liken us? A newborn babe. Remember, there's two births. There's the, the physical birth. And, and for me, that was 34 years ago. For you, it was however many years ago. But then there was a spiritual birth. That moment in which you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were spiritually born, and now we are likened unto a, a newborn babe. A, 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 a brand new baby. A brand new one. Now, to me... Uh, this right here reads as a command, you know, when we read something like this. Uh, you know, thank God for, for commas. Commas. Well, why? I mean, illustrate this to you. Why is it that it is, why are, are commas important for, for us? Okay. So now, where should we see the commas? I like cooking my family and my pets. <laughs> Commas are very important. I like cooking. Comma. My family. Comma. And my pets. Okay, good. Without those commas, it can be very confusing. Now, if you look in the scripture, sometimes we read it like this. As new war babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Okay, but what does that suggest without the commas? It's saying as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, it's saying that this newborn babe is desiring the milk. Okay, 
Now, is that what this scripture is saying? Well, if we look back, there's some commas in here. A comma changes how it reads. So where do we see it? As newborn babes, comma, desire the sincere milk of the word, comma, that she may grow thereby. What does that mean? Well, imagine that you're talking to someone. Okay. As newborn babes, you've been likened unto a babe. You're brand new in faith. Now it's a command. He's saying desire it. Desire that milk. He's not saying that because you're a baby, you're desiring milk. He's saying, no, to you, you are likened unto the baby. Desire. Desire the milk of the word, the very word of God. Desire the Bible is teaching us. Now, we are likened unto newborn babes. We're, we're born again. We're on that second, that spiritual birth. We're now just simply babes. And now in 3, go ahead and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And in verse 18, go ahead and get there. The last verse of 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So what's our fill in the blank right there? To grow in grace. To grow in grace. You know, when we think about it, if we're a baby, we're, we're, we're brand new, we just got born, we're in that first year of our Christianity, you know, the Bible tells us right here to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord or Savior Jesus Christ, and Him be glory. You know, a baby can do nothing, absolutely nothing on its own. Moms, whew, praise God for moms, I'd be lost without my wife. Uh, you know, babies can do two things. They can cry, and they can do that, that other thing that we're not going to talk about right now up here. But you think about like a baby horse. Anybody ever raised on a farm? A baby horse, a baby cow. They can walk within hours of being born. Within hours. Dogs and cats will reach maturity within months of birth. But human babies come. They come into the world utterly helpless. They can do nothing for themselves. And they remain dependent upon their parents for many, many, many years. What's the expectation? The, the expectation for my children is that they would grow. You know, we're, 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 we're looking at what does God expect of me? What does God expect of us? Well, he expects for us to be born again. He expects for us to be babes. And as babes, he expects for us right there in 2 Peter to grow in grace. We're not going to stay spiritual babes forever. That's not where God wants us to be. He wants us to get saved and now grow. Desire that milk of the word. Get into it. Learn something. Grow. Become a, a, a toddler. Become a young adult. You know, get to teenagehood. Uh, you know, continue to grow. Now, we're done with that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Back a few books. 1 Corinthians, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll just read the first three verses of chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first three verses. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Very clearly, right here. What does the Lord call a Christian who doesn't grow spiritually? Carnal. A carnal. Carnal man. They're fleshly. You know, it's somebody, a carnal person, it's someone who cares about the flesh, the things that pertain to the flesh. Uh, someone who is sensual, indulgent, lustful. It's the exact opposite in, uh, of spiritual. They're worried about the pleasures of life. A, a natural man, an unregenerate man. Now, Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity, or being an enemy, against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Can be. So what does God expect of us? Well, he expects for us to not be carnal. He expects for us to to deny the flesh. He expects for us to grow and to become spiritual, to grow in grace. Amen. Not to grow in carnality Christian, but to grow into a spiritual Christian. Uh, 
you know, we can get caught up comparing ourselves with each other. And, and that's not why. We shouldn't do that. That's something a carnal man would do. A spiritual man compares himself to Christ. Amen. Compare yourself to Christ. And then hunger and thirst to be more like Christ. Not to be more like this pastor or more to be like that man. But to be more like Christ. That's what a spiritual man does. Amen. All right. Now Ephesians chapter 4. Go ahead. Just a few chapters ahead. Galatians and Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And go ahead and get to verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. I'll go ahead and read. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I got a phone call this week from my brother. He's going to seminary. And uh, uh, he's, he's got all these questions. Praise God, he's got all these questions about, you know, little, little, little lowercase g gods. Um, he, he's got all these questions about, well, what do you believe about Golgotha uh, and, and Goliath and, and Gath and buried outside of the city of Jerusalem? Anybody ever heard of this stuff before? UFO, fringe theology, man, I had never heard of it. It's so weak. You know what I thought? I thought that's so silly. Yeah. Want to know why? Because it's not in the Bible. Yeah. It's not in the Bible. So if I don't read it in the Bible, I'm not going to believe it. It's not scripture. It's not inspired. God doesn't want, you, doesn't want me to know that. Yeah. And so he's getting all caught up in all these different things, and uh, I just was not worried about it. Look at that question. Into what does the Lord want his children? Really, that is all for you to fill out. And I'll tell you what I wrote. That's, that's for something maybe you can take home, you can fill it in. This is what I wrote. This is what I believe the Lord wants his children. He wants for us to grow into a Christian. A Christian. He wants us to be Christ-like Bible believers who know what they believe because the Bible says so. He wants us all to become part of that body, the body of Christ. All right. Now, we have figured that out. We, we've seen four things. That we're born again. We become a newborn babe when we're born again, right? And that we are to grow in grace. That's what God wants us to do now with our life. He wants us to grow. Don't be a carnal man. Be a spiritual man. Uh, be a Bible believer. Find out what the Bible says and grow thereby. Now, what I've got, if you were to turn that page, that next part right there is going to be our acrostic. And it says the seven steps to Christian growth. Seven steps to Christian growth. Here. And so our first one, we've got a big old G right there. Now, our scripture for this right there, Hebrews 10.25, go ahead and turn there. Hebrews is right after all of the T books. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and then Hebrews. Thank you. Alright, seven steps to Christian growth. We have a big old G. All right, Hebrews 10, and in verse 25, I'll go ahead and read and follow along. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's what we're doing here tonight. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, do you want to grow? Well, do you, do you want to grow into maybe that next stage of whatever it is for your Christian growth? Well, go to church as much as you can. When you go to church, you are going to grow going to grow because, well, we can exhort one another, we can learn, we can uh, lift each other up. Maybe somebody has a question and they can come and they can ask. You know, it's very different if I call you on the phone. Whether I call you on the phone and I'm trying to exhort you, I'm trying to lift you up, I'm trying to encourage you in your life. Well, if I have you on the phone, it's going to be hard to do that. But if we're together, there's a whole lot more that we could do together versus just over the phone. Man, Amen. like a Zoom call? Zoom church? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a silly point, but you don't see that in the Bible. No, the people always gather. It's an assembly, a local assembly. Amen. Now go to a Bible-believing Baptist church. The seven steps of Christian growth, go to church. Maybe you go uh, once a week. Praise God for once a week. Man, 
can, if you could work on what's that next step, I'm going to try to go Saturday. Try to go to Soul, Soul Winning. I'm going to try to go Sunday morning. Uh, I do Sunday morning. I do Sunday night. I'm there Thursday. Okay, how about Sunday school at the 10 o'clock? Man, there's always something that we can be doing, and going to church is going to help you. Now, I ran into this uh, study, and I thought it was very interesting, and I wanted to share it with you, and it has to do with going to church. So 90% of new members, okay, new members, the people who come into our church, this is what 90% of new members, they will stay in a church for three reasons, these three things right here. Number one, they can articulate their faith. That means that they're being taught. They're being fed. You know, they're, they're able to explain. They say, well, I was saved, and this is how I was saved, and then I was baptized, I was baptized because of this. When people are grow, uh, growing, they're going along in that path with the Lord, they're going to want to stay in the church because, well, it's good for them, it's helping them, and they're seeing that. Uh, number two, 90% of new members will stay in the church if they belong to subgroups. And this is really the reason why I stayed as well. Uh, what got me to stay in church. It was, uh, you know, the involvement in choir, Bible study, Sunday school classes. My first Sunday school teacher, I was just a, I was just a wreck. And, you know, I've been invited, invited, invited to Sunday school. And this is what changed for me. I decided to go one time. I just decided to go. When I was there, that very first Sunday, Brody, the very first Sunday, just the very first Sunday that I went, you know what the Sunday school teacher asked me to do? He said, next Sunday, can you bring breakfast for everybody? And it was like a big deal. I was like, yeah, I can bring breakfast for everybody. So I'll, the next Sunday, I'm thinking about it all week. Uh, Sunday morning comes, and I don't have any idea what to do. And so what did I do? I went through the drive through at McDonald's and picked up like 20 Egg McMuffins, brought it to Sunday school, and it was important to me, brother. It was a big deal to me. I, I thought it was a, a huge deal. And so for me, I absolutely agree with this one right here. When people find their place and they get plugged into church, they have a ministry, they have something where they're serving people and helping Man, people are going to want to stay in church that much more. Now, the third thing, remember, seven steps to Christian growth, that they can articulate their faith, they're growing, they, they belong to subgroups, they're getting plugged into different things. But the third thing, they have four to eight close friends. You know, nobody wants to go to a church where, where no one's friendly, no one's talking to them, everyone's getting judged, and they, they sit by themselves, they're, you know. Friendships, you know, a man who uh, has friends must show himself friendly. And so when people come in these doors, you know, even us as well, we can be friendly with one another. We can Amen. say, hey, what are you doing after church? Let's go get some Mexican. Uh, hey, just calling you during the week. Uh, and I've been bad about this. I should call you guys. I really should. I should call you guys more. Uh, but that's what friends do. Why? Because, you know, that's what people who care about each other do. Amen. Now, seven steps to Christian growth. Number one, go to a Bible-believing Baptist church. Amen for it. Now, the second thing right here. What do you think that is? Read. Read. All right, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Read. All right. Read. And when someone gets there, go ahead and stand up, and in your biggest voice, go ahead and read it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. That you may grow thereby. Yes, sir, that's right. And now, Acts chapter 17. I like Acts chapter 17. We're going to go there. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. We see Paul and Silas at Berea. All right. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So they were taught something. And so what did they do? Well, the Thessalonians, they didn't care. But the Bereans, the city over, they took those scriptures, they took that Old Testament, and they searched out what they were taught, whether it was true or not. And that's how we should be. You want to grow, well, read your Bible. Amen. The Bible is like, it's like a telescope. A man looks through his telescope, and he sees worlds beyond. But if he looks at his telescope, he doesn't see anything but a telescope. The Bible is a thing to be looked through to see that which is beyond but most people only look at it so that they can see, and the only thing that they see is, well, that's written by man, it's a dead letter, there's nothing to it. You know, the Bible, oh, have you ever heard that? Oh, okay, here it is. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right, yeah. Now, the Bible in the hand is worth two in the bookcase. <laughs> and we should keep that Bible in our hands, you know, that somebody said, an old preacher said, if everybody were to blow the dust off of their Bible, it would cause the biggest dust storm in America. 
everything stinks. We are Christians. We should be reading that Bible. Hey, do you want to grow? Seven steps to Christian growth. Go to church. Read your Bible. Uh, I, I once interviewed a pastor, and I asked him, I said, what, uh, what is a book, a book other than the Bible, that you've read that has changed your life forever? You know, you, you would expect it would be, oh, this book on the home, or this book on prayer. Maybe it was The Great Gatsby, you know, or I read uh, 1984, something like that, and it stuck out to me. But that old preacher, he said, other than the Bible? And he thought, and he said, well, the Bible. And then he took me and just said exactly how he reads the Bible. And, I mean, that's what a pastor is to do, to keep pointing you back to the Bible, to keep pointing you back to Jesus Christ, you know, the Bible. It, it really, it can't be downplayed, and it can't be upplayed enough. The, the reading of the Bible will help you, it will help me, it will help us in the greatest way to grow spiritually. And I can't understand it. Uh, you know, there was a, a man in my Sunday school class, and he came to me and he said, I've, I've been reading my Bible. Every morning I've been reading just as much as I can before I have to go to work. And he said, and you know what? First of all, I had seen a difference in him. In his countenance, his marriage, his kids, everything changed. And he said, you know what? He said, it, it has helped me so much in my home, with my own attitude, you know, yelling at the kids, getting upset, quarreling, button heads with the wife. Uh, you know, I say kicking the dog, he didn't say that. At your job, you know, at church, just any relationship that you have in your life, there's just a peace. When we read this book, it is supernatural, and I don't understand it, but I do know that when I read the Bible, that it works. Amen. It just helps everything. Everything comes together. I feel a peace. I know it's just God. He's just kind of patting us on the head and saying, good job. Read my word. It's Amen. going to help you in a great way. Now, the next thing. Oh, what's that right there? Okay. Okay. All right, Acts chapter 2. Let's go. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. See if we can... See if we can find it in here. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, I'll read. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Oh, it's obey. 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 You want to grow? Obey what you read in the Bible. Amen. You read something. It tells you something. It convicts you. It pricks you in the heart. Obey what you read. Put it into practice immediately. You know, when we read something in the Bible, or we maybe hear it in the preaching of God's Word, maybe uh, it convicts you right there in your soul, or you're challenged in an area that you need to grow, just obey God right away. The further that you put it off, the more that you separate yourself from it, and you wake up, and you read the Bible, and you see something you've never seen before, and it pricks you, man, I should go to Sunday night service. And then the day goes on. You go to work, an hour later, you forget about it. You've got to deal with someone that's gas pump. You forget about it. Take that feeling and do something. Amen. Put it into practice to me. You know, a true, what is, what, what is obedience? It's a true a loving and full submission, and we should act on it right away. If I tell my son to do something and he doesn't do it right away, he is not obeying me because he is delaying his obedience. That's not true obedience. True obedience, right away, from the heart, immediately going to obey. And that's exactly what God wants from us. Now, part of this obedience is that we are to be baptized. Okay, baptism. We are showing after our salvation that we are not ashamed to be numbered with Jesus Christ. Amen. We trust him as our Savior. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, the next thing that we're to be obedient in is to get baptized after that. Amen. It's the first act of obedience after salvation towards God because he commands it in the church ordinances. There's two ordinances. We have the Lord's Supper, where we remember the Lord and what he has done for us with his broken body and his shed blood. And then you have baptism. The only two ordinances of the church. Now, next we have W. What do you think this one is? Acts chapter 1. We're, we're pretty close. Go ahead. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just a few pages back. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. 
and unto the uttermost part of the earth. W. Witness. Witness. Amen. Witness, witness, witness. Well, what is witnessing? Go soul winning. Amen. Go out and tell somebody about your testimony. Go out and tell somebody about what God did for you in your own life. Man, God, I was a, I was a, I was a sinner. I still am a sinner. But God saved me. I'm a saved sinner. This is what he did for me in my own life. And then you look back a few years later and you're able to say, look at all that God has done for me. I can tell other people about that because I have a testimony for him. Uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Man, you shall receive that power. The Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses where? Here, there, all over the entire world. Amen. That's what we are to do. Witness. Every Christian should be ready to give the gospel. You know, you think about uh, some men. Maybe even some men in here are afraid that I would ever ask them to stand up and pray in front of everybody. What if I were to ask you to stand up and come and give us a 10 minute message? Would that freak you out? Well, there's always one thing that you can go to. There's always one sermon that you have. There's always a, is that called condition one in the military? You always got one in the chamber. It's your testimony. You go to John 3.16, you read it, and then you tell them how Jesus saved you. This is what happened in my own life. And guess what? Conclusion? The application? You too can get saved. Man, that's amazing. Every Christian should be ready to give that gospel. Next time you have an opportunity to give the gospel, just, just do it. It's the exact same thing I was talking about in obedience. When, when you feel that fear, and I know you feel that fear because I do too. When you feel that fear, and you have that invite in your hand, and you're knocking on that door, or you're at that gas pump, or you're walking down the road, or you're at work, don't be afraid to say, hey, I just want to give this to you because it made a difference in my life. You know, Jesus loves you. You wouldn't have this. Somebody might say that. I was just praying to the Lord this morning. You know, the man who preached the message, is there a king in need? Um, Jamie Jackson, Anchor Baptist Church, 2021, preached the message. During that message, he recalled a time he was late for a, uh, a meeting at his church, his staff. He was going to this meeting, and uh, he said he was late, he was rushing. There was a man at the bus stop. Zoom past. Something told him to turn back. He said, no, I have to get to my meeting at church. I can't get back there. That man at the bus stop. He kept going, and something, God, pricking him in his heart. Turn around, give that man the gospel. Turn around and give that man the gospel. Ugh. Yes, Lord. He does a U-turn. He goes back. He goes to the bus stop. He talks to that man. Uh, he gives him the gospel. Hands him an invite. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? The man is, he just starts crying. He says, this morning I prayed to God and I said, if you do not reveal yourself to me today, Lord, I'm going to kill myself. It is a big deal that we witness to people. Amen. If you don't, if you don't open your mouth, you know, who's going to tell that person about God? Who's going to tell them about Jesus Christ, the cross, the blood, the sacrifice, and how you can have salvation too? You could be right next to someone headed for hell for all of eternity. And because of your anxiety, because of you being scared, you won't give the gospel. You'll say, no, it's too early. They're not interested. There's no way they would listen to me. Mm. Man, they're right there next to you every yeah. single day. Every single day. We're commanded to witness. Amen. Don't, don't back away. Don't be afraid. Don't make excuses. Don't shy away from it. Just embrace it. Just, just, just go with this. Kind of like a roller coaster, man. You fight that thing, it's just going to take you. Mm -hmm. Just enjoy it. Amen. You know, when you feel that, use that. Use that feeling that you have. God will help. Amen. God will help you. Pray about it. Now, often, this is what happens. We, we get to complain. We get down on ourselves. We get focused on our own issues, and we miss the blessing that we can be to other people. I recently had received great advice from a pastor. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, known a long time. He said that when the ministry gets you down, and it will. When that burden gets so great, and it will. When the people stab you in the back, and all hope seems to be gone in your life, and it will come, and it will happen, go soul winning. Mm -hmm. Man, it'll help. It'll help you in a great way. I don't understand it. I don't know. You know, the, the, the feeling. Whenever I tell, you know, talk to someone who's depressed, 28-year-old young man, who says, I'm depressed. I've got nothing going on, on in my life. He's got nothing going on in his life because his 
eyes and his mind and everything is focused on himself and not on other people. Yeah. The beautiful thing about Christianity, the way that God has built into the very fabric of Christianity, is for us to be selfless, not mm. selfish. Amen. And when you take your eyes off yourself, you go out there and you put yourself out there in those anxious positions, you, you care about another person and their soul, well, it's going to help you in a great way. Amen. Why? Well, it's just simply the way God made it. We're, we're intended, we're, we're commanded, God made it so that way we're to go out and soul and tell people. It'll help you. Amen. Sunday evening, we stuck around for another hour and a half. My wife and I had things to do. We drove out. Isn't that crazy timing? We drove out, and guess who's walking right, right through our property, right where our sign's at? Well, they were wearing suits, and they had little name tags. And um, my wife, it's almost like when you, you see Bigfoot or lightning. That's a Mormon. Man, so what I do, I slammed it in the park. I jumped out, and I ran. I was probably, I said, are you Mormons? And they said, yeah, we're Mormons. I'm an elder this, and I'm an elder that, and they're about 18 years old. And I said, okay, praise God. Guys are elders after the order of Melchizedek. The great thing is I have been, uh, <laughs> I have been studying up on Mormons for like two months. And so I knew exactly what they believed. And if you remember a few weeks, about three weeks ago, we, we went through their articles of their faith, all 13, so I was able to talk to them about it. And I gave them an invite. I gave them the gospel. They don't believe it. They believe works. You have to do, do, do all these things to please, please, please God, and then you'll be able to earn heaven. Uh, and they deny, they even deny that the Bible is, is infallible, that it's the yeah. truth, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. That's from God. But anyway, do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? Witness to people. God wants you to grow. What's that next step for you in witnessing? That next step for you could be grabbing some of these invites off of the back table as you walk out. That next step after that might be when you're going through the Cane's drive through or that Taco Bell drive through and you could say, I just wanted to give this to you as an invite to my church. That could be the next step for you. The next step for somebody else could be showing up on Saturday to go and tell people about what happened in your own life. Go soul winning. I don't know where you're at in your soul winning. I don't know. But God wants you to grow into that next step. All right. Now this one right here, uh, all right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll go ahead and turn there. We have the time. This one's going to go a little long tonight, you guys, but I, I appreciate I appreciate very much. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I had a conversation with uh, a lady. She walked in the service 10 minutes before service, and we talked about this exact passage. She had questions about it, and I thought that was very neat. It was like God sent her. 1 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. The Bible reads, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Well, why are why does God command us right here to uh, let a man examine himself, right? Examine. Oh, by the way, what do you think the E stands for? Examine. Examine, okay. <laughs> now, I, I, I'll tell you right now, I, I've got to get some help. If some man could just stand up, like a brother Mike, kind of a man could just stand up, and they would want to be... You know, they help. Okay, great. But Mike, if you could just come up here so everybody can see you, and then just tell them a little bit about yourself. A little bit about Brother Mike. You got the floor. I'm Brother Mike. I'm your brother. Hello, sisters and brothers. No, you don't want pink. Oh, no. Yellow. I regret my decision right now. <laughs> But here I am. Ah, um, I'm an electrician. Ah. <laughs> oh yeah, that one doesn't work. You got to tell them some yelling jokes. Why the chicken cross the room? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> What's the chicken's favorite day? Friday. Mm. Uh, but Mike, this <clears throat> is yours, sir. Now you just take that right there. That is your balloon. Examine yourself. Okay, so as that balloon, you know, when we get when we get comfortable, that's when we're in our most danger. Both as a church and as individuals, we think of a balloon, and it must constantly be kept off the ground. Remember when you were a child? Okay, you remember the game. Go ahead. You have to keep it off the ground, but you can't pull. Very good. Okay, now do it as long as you can, brother. Keep going. I can go all, day. all right. We think of what did you say? I can go all day. He says he can go all day. I'm glad he said that. 
must be constantly, this balloon must be constantly kept off the ground by smacking it. But because of gravity, like our sinful nature, it always is pulling the balloon down. Now, in order to keep it from the floor, we must constantly watch, constantly examine our own lives and our own hearts. Now, as a man, right there, that's a, a representation of you always having to examine your heart, examine your mind, and examine what's going on in your life, right? You want to stay close with God. You want to pray. You want to uh, make sure that you wake up and that you um, put your heart right and put on that whole armor of God. But then things in life, man, they happen. And so as you are trying to uh, keep this thing, you know, off of, off of the ground, things start to happen. You say, uh, anybody got a Bible? You see that Bible right there. You know, hey, brother, uh, you know, we got Bible study right here. And so we'd love to see you in Bible study. Uh, oh, right. So now he's got Bible study. He's got this going on in his life. Uh, oh, brother, it's uh, for you, the Lord's calling. So if you could take that phone call and talk, you're not going to talk with the Lord. You got to talk to Him. You got to tell Him what's going on in your life, right? And so you're still trying to keep your heart right with God. You're still trying to examine yourself. You're going. You're on the phone. You're also you're reading your Bible. You're going to church. But then, man, ah, it's Thursday evening, and the the very the, <laughs> you've got practice tonight too. And so you've got this going on in your life also. And, uh, you know, you want to be a blessing, you want to help the church, you want to be a, 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 a help to everybody else. And then, man, it's getting hard, brother, it's, it's getting hard, but you can still do it. But then you forget at home, you've still got a garden at home. Oh, no. You still, oh, no, he's got it. No, you get a little help from a brother, you get a little bit of help right there. You know, we bear each other's uh, burden, but you forgot. There's also... Your garden at home because you don't want to neglect your house. Whew. Okay, you don't want to neglect, you don't want to forget about it. And that's good. That is wonderful. That's good stuff right there. And so, what are you trying to do? You're trying your absolute best. Okay, actually, pink. Yes. You're doing a great, great job. And you're actually able to do it. And you're able to do it for a, a, quite a while, maybe even. But you're the leader of your home. You're the spiritual leader of your house. And you're supposed to help your wife out also. And what happens? I gotta keep her up. Something falls. Something happens. And he, he focuses on the wife. That's good. But it's just that you put all that stuff down, bro. It's just a picture of exactly how it can be within our own lives. You know, we don't want... We don't want that to hit the floor. We want to try to keep it up as long as we can. And we have all of these different things going on, but we have to examine ourselves constantly. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. When we are to eat of that bread and we are to drink of that cup, why it tells us to examine ourselves is because if we do it unworthily, then we're, bringing, we're drinking and we're eating damnation unto ourselves. We need to have our hearts absolutely right with God. And so part of Christian growth, part of what God wants us to do, is to constantly examine ourselves and to not drop that balloon. When we drop that balloon and we have focus on all these other things that are going on in our life, well, that's not pleasing to God. It's going to have to be something else that goes. Because you have got to keep that, that heart close with God, that first love. You want to grow? Take stock of where you are. Take stock of where you were a year ago, where you are, and then where you want to be. Where you want to be in a year. Examine yourself continually because you're never there. You're never going to be where you want to be at. You're always constantly growing. You're always constantly striving. But you have got to examine yourself. You have got to keep yourself right with God during that. That is a huge part of growth that gets overlooked a lot. Don't ever forget that. All right, next. T. What do you think? Go ahead. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6. Philippians, a couple more chapters right before the T books. Philippians chapter 4, right before Colossians. Chapter 4, the last chapter, I believe. And in verse 6, oh, I love this one. Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, the Bible reads, Be careful for nothing. nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. T. Thanksgiving. Thank God. Daily in prayer. 
thank. He thanks God. It's a reminder. It's a reminder to us to thank God. It's a reminder for us to pray. You want to grow? You're going to have to pray. And how often are you going to pray? Daily. Amen. Pray to him daily. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by what? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing, but pray for everything. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 is another good one, but it, here's something that happens in prayer. If the, request, if the requ request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the, requ the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, God says go. I like it. When Amen. you wake up, man, this is a hard habit right here. You got five minutes. Five minutes, you got to go and break. When you wake up, here's the challenge. Here's the habit. You want to grow? Make God a priority in your life by praying. Very, the very first thing that you do when your feet hit the floor, when you wake up, immediately pray. Lord, this is your servant, Chris. Thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for giving me another day. Help me this day to glorify and to honor you. Amen. Man, it's simple as that. Make it a habit. Do it every day. Acknowledge God first. Sometimes we go through our lives, we wake up, and we do 500 things. And then at the very end, what do we do? We, we sit by our bed, we maybe read a chapter of the Bible, and then we maybe pray before we go to bed. We're giving, we're giving God the very last minute or five of our day and neglecting him all the rest of it. We should set it, it right at the very beginning, at the very outset, at the go. Program yourself. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to put him first in every day, every single day. I'm going to pray to him. If you want to grow, pray more. Now, H, Malachi chapter 3.10, you know it, but let's go to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, so you can see them in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. Chapter 16 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. I'll read the closing instructions of Paul to the Corinthians. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no more gatherings when I come. You know, that first day of the week, uh, uh, to who he's writing to, that would be known as Sunday. You know, Sunday is the very first day of the week. For us, we are to honor God with the time. Amen. Honor God with the time. You know, God, he doesn't need our money. Right. It's not about money. Honor God with the time. It's, it's our God is the God who owns uh, the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen. He has no need for our money. It's not that. He has zero need. It's sacrifice. Amen. It's the proper placement of things in our lives that never should come in between us and God. Amen. I, I never understood it. I always thought, you know, how can 90% of my income be better than 100% of my income? I'm not stupid. That doesn't make sense. There's no way I'm going to follow something like that. But here's the thing. The 90% is better because that 90% comes with God's blessing. Amen. He sees. He knows. He rewards. Yep. We just simply give God what is already his. We give it back to him. It's his. We esteem God highly. And so we say, here, Lord, I'm just giving you back. I'm just giving it back. In respect, we give it to him in respect. We give it to him in reverence. We give him the proper dignity, and we submit to God his time. Amen. And that's all that it is. You want to grow? Well, here's some simple things that you can do. Go to church. Read your Bible. Obey what you read. Witness to people. Examine yourselves. Thank God daily with prayer and honor God with the tithe. If you do all of those things, man, you'd be honoring. You'd be pleasing God. You'd be growing as a Christian. You say, I'm already doing all of those things. Then take the next step in each one. There's always something more that we could be doing in each one of these things. Amen. Go to church. Okay. Are you going to every church service that you can? And if you're not, work your way to where you can. Why? Because it's going to please God and it's going to help you grow. Amen. Read your Bible. Read it more. I mean, that's not going to hurt you. I did have to tell a man one time to put his Bible down and spend time with his wife. Only one time. He was a, that was a case. He was a different, different kind of man. Obey God. We can always be more obedient. Why? Because we're not.
are not perfect. Amen. And don't try to be perfect. You know what they did to the last guy who was perfect? Yeah. Oh, man, I wish that one fell right, right in the face. <laughs> witness, we can always witness more. I know that's a fact because I have trouble witnessing to everybody that I come in contact with. That's normal. It, it's weird. I'm, I'm walking past somebody in the store, and I'm like, hey, by the way. And then someone's, hey, by the way. Hey, by the way. We can always do more witnessing. We can always do more. We, just, we can grow in it. Examine yourselves. That's going to be a struggle for the rest of our lives. You know, thanking God with prayer, pray more. Pray in the very morning, pray in the noon, pray in the night. Psalm 55, honor God with the tithe. You know, okay, I give 10%. And I'm faithful, I give my 10%. Well, give sacrificially. Give to missions. Uh, <laughs> Amen. I think that's all I got. Please stand with me. And then Thursday evenings, what am I trying to do? What are we trying to do? I'm trying to train you in the doctrines, the basics. I know that we went a little bit later, and I'd say thank you so much, church. Uh, and next Thursday, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be jumping into the ABCs of Christianity. And so we're going to be in either A or Z. I might do it backwards. I might jump around. Who knows? No, I'll do A. It'll be A next week. And so you wonder, what's A? The, okay, the basic doctrines of Christianity, A. And you guys want to know what it is? Yes, sir. Good. I'm not going to say you got to come next Thursday to find that little person. Dear Lord, we love you, God. We need you. Thank you so much for being good to us. Help us, Lord, to grow in each one of these areas. God, we love you. We need you. Help us to remember these as uh, we carry out our lives right here, trying to honor you, trying to please you. And Lord, we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.